there, and welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. I love that we get to share our platform with members of our health IT community. As we approach the annual HIMSS conference, we'll be sharing bonus episodes with Grace Vinton as a guest host, interviewing lady bosses in her network to share their expertise and advice. So this is Joy, passing the mic to Grace. Take it away. Welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. This is High Tea with Grace, where we spill the tea on HIT. I'm honored to welcome Sheila Tolton, President and CEO of Gray Matter Analytics. Sheila, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. We are very excited to learn from you today. So tell us all about yourself and the career path that brought you to Gray Matter Analytics. Well, the career path has been one that's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. Not always as we like it to be, you know, straight up. Sometimes you have to go parallel and sideways and then you go back forward. But uh, it's been great. And I've been in technology all of my career. So when I graduated from college or just before graduation, I only interviewed with three technology companies and I got an offer from two of the three. So I always knew that that's where I wanted to be. And I've had a great 35 year career um, in technology. I've touched the hardware side of the business, software, consulting services, and I'm back with software right now at Gray Matter Analytics. Wow. So tell us about Gray Matter Analytics. Uh, What's your mission over there and what do you do to make that mission a reality? So Gray Matter Analytics is a software as a service company focused in healthcare, both hospital systems as well as health insurers. And our mission is to improve the quality of care for all and also to be able to help clinicians and administrative uh, people manage the cost of care. And we've all have heard how extreme the uh, cost of care has continually been rising. And we have an aging population. So that's going to continue because just of the demographics. Wow. Wow. And so where do you get all of this data that you are managing and analyzing? Well, you know, healthcare is a, a gold mine for data. Our job is to take the data and turn it into information. So most of the data that we use today with our clients, it's in their four walls. The holy grail, though, is when we can take their data and then integrate it with external data, whether that's data about uh, geospatial of where people are living or whether that's other clinical data that might be from another health system or even what's called a health health information exchange, which many hospitals contribute to HIEs is the acronym. Wow. And so what are they, how are they using the data, um, particularly in a clinical sense to help close care gaps? You know, I know that data is being used in that way. Um, You know, what are some ways that they're using it to close some care gaps? Well, I'll give you one example. There's a program in the Medicare Shared Savings Program called Risk Adjustment. Mm -hmm. And this particular program both manages cost of care as well as improves the quality of care. And they reward health systems for getting patients that have chronic diseases and need to have an annual wellness visit. They get to build Medicare more. At the same time, if you think about it, if you have a person with a chronic disease and they haven't been in for an annual wellness visit, That's not helping the quality of care. So that's an example of a program that our software system um, helps health systems be able to, A, uh, maximize and get reimbursed for the the care that they've delivered and also improve the quality of care. Yeah, so it's really a financial incentive in addition to an actual incentive to improve outcomes. And having that data and analyzing that data can help better uh, take advantage of both. That's right. That's exactly Very interesting. And and you want to also find uh, these patients in particular early even when before they have been diagnosed with some of these diseases, because there are signs, right? Uh, High blood pressure, you know, uh, uh, having uh, high sugar levels. So obesity, there are signs that, you know, they're headed towards potentially some very bad uh, outcomes relative to developing a chronic disease. 
Wow. So how does that advanced analytics then identify the disease development risk for early intervention? So, you know, do, do they kind of do it by age or is it, you know, by their family it's history? A combination. It's mm-hmm. a combination. And that's why you really need technology because age is just one factor of many. I mentioned the fact of obesity. That's another factor. Mm-hmm. And then there are things that people have that's part of their DNA, such as There are a number of people that have a high propensity to have high cholesterol. Well, that's another factor. And then there's the things around social determinants of health. A lot of health outcomes are determined by your access to good quality food, access to physicians, transportation to get to see a doctor, access and being able to buy the drugs that you might have been prescribed. So there's a number of different factors that is impossible for individuals to look at all these factors and be proactive in determining who are these patients. That's true. Could you imagine without data and analytics having to do it just by hand? And I know that's what they had to do before and you couldn't reach every person that way. That's right. And you need to prioritize, right? I mean, there are some that are early on signals and then there are some that have been diagnosed. And as I said earlier, that need to come in for a regular annual wellness visit. Wow, wow. Now, since we're a podcast geared towards women, I'm interested to hear what social determinants of health data points are most impactful to women in particular um, to close those care gaps. And do they differ from those that are tracked for men? Well, first of all, let me clarify, I am not a clinician. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> but clearly, there are some diseases that are, women have a higher propensity to uh, get, such as breast cancer, for example. Mm. And they, we know that, uh, again, there's a, a hereditary component to breast cancer, but there's also a food component. I often say to uh, people that food is either medicine or poison. And if you're eating the wrong things and or abusing alcohol or or other types of drugs, um, you have a higher propensity to potentially contract or have uh, breast cancer. But then, you know, there's our reproductive uh, uh, system itself, which is very different than obviously what men have. And there's a health issues there, you know, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, I mean, all of those things. So yes, absolutely. And you can see Across the country, a number of health systems have hospitals that are devoted to women's health. For example, here in Chicago, we have Prentice Hospital, which is part of the Northwestern system. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And we have also heard a lot about maternal um, maternal care and how that's kind of on the rise. And maybe some of these early interventions could be useful for women who are pregnant and maybe at high at risk. And not just... Um, the physical aspects of maternal, but also the mental aspects of Mm -hmm. There's a lot of women that have postpartum syndrome, you know, after giving birth. And uh, and there's a a stress level of being a new mom or even adding to your family if you already are a mom. That's interesting. So do you feel like um, that this data is also used for behavioral health intervention as well? We have built a number of models for behavioral health at uh, Gray Matter, and we're just starting, meaning as a society, to look at the component of behavioral health. Behavioral health is tied to physical health. Oh, absolutely. Yes. If you're having challenges from a behavioral health perspective, you might be overeating. You might not be eating at all. All of these things will contribute to physical health challenges and outcomes. So now I can tell you that both health insurers as well as health providers are paying much more attention to behavioral health. The challenge is, getting back to the data, oftentimes those types of information when a person is seeing a physician is captured in the clinical notes and not so much in structured data. So you need to be able to have what we call in the industry natural language processing so that you can actually capture unstructured data to be able to understand what's really going on in a person's life. Hmm. 
Now, natural language processing, that is used in the data to help uh, understand what's happening in the clinical notes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes when you're seeing a physician, they will ask you about, you know, how are you eating? Um, do you live alone? And they usually are capturing those in handwritten notes and not mm -hmm. so much in a structured format. Yes, that makes sense. Very interesting. So then natural language processing is used to help get information from those clinical notes. That's right. So I'm wondering, can you walk me through how the transition to value impacts how data is used by your customers versus how data used to be used? I think um, I'll give you one example. Uh, you know, right now, and, and it's been even before COVID, our health systems are really stretched. The people mm -hmm. who work in health systems are overworked. And I don't mean just because of COVID. It was true even before that. And one of the things that um, there are some diseases that are you know, treated uniquely because they happen to be unique to this individual. But then there are some things like hip replacements, knee replacements that have become routine. Well, one of the things that the data does allow is for physicians to be able to see some outcomes from their colleagues doing similar procedures, but maybe they use a different medical device, maybe they use a different anesthetic, and it's really hard to be able to mine that kind of data again without being able to have analytics and the ability to integrate and aggregate data. Mm, very true. So they're learning from their colleagues through That's these outcomes right. and from through the data itself That's and, right. and the, analyzing the data. Yeah. That's really interesting. Because, uh, I mean, back to being stretched, I mean, you know, every, you know, there are sometimes, you know, bad actors, but in general, clinicians want to do what's best for their patients and learn. And if there's a better way or another way that the procedure has been done, serve up the information so that they can see it. And it doesn't mean it's always applicable to all of their patients, mm -hmm. but at least it's another data point for them. Yes. And the data is power we're learning. <laughs> that definitely from, from COVID and, and beyond, it's, it's data, having access to that data is powerful. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering on a personal level, you're a very busy executive, you know, woman, president and CEO here, and, um, you know, I've had a long career. Um, what are things that you do to work your best and make a difference? Well, um, I don't. I, are you referring relative to make a difference in my community or? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, um, one thing I'm a big believer in is in taking care of your body. Mm -hmm. So I work out a lot. I have for a very long time. I used to run long distances. I don't do that anymore, but I still am an adamant about taking care of your body. So eating right and exercise is very important to me. And also that's tied to community because when you're doing work in the community, in particular with young children, um, I do teach Sunday school at my church because I want to be connected to children. They are like sponges and they observe how you behave and what things that you incorporate in your life. So, but for me, um, back to women, one place that I am very connected to is a place here in Chicago called Margaret's Village. And it's a homeless shelter for women with children. Oh, and wow. I, I feel very strongly about this particular shelter. Number one, there are not a lot of shelters that women can bring children. And number two, you know, this particular shelter, we make sure that the kids stay in their original school um, so that they're not moving around, even though as a family, they may, may be moving around from you know, a shelter. So I particularly really care about women and women being you know, able to take care of their children and stay with their children. That is so inspirational. And have you done um, things like that with the whole company? Uh, have you worked with, with yes, the I shelter? Have. It's mm -hmm. funny that you mentioned that. So um, prior to uh, COVID, at Christmas time, my whole company, we would get a list from the shelter of the kids and what the kids wanted for Christmas. And we would have a wrapping 
present that party. And then we would deliver the presents to the shelter. This year, I personally went last Sunday to deliver some things just for the holidays. And then member, members of my company are going to be sending things via Amazon to the shelter. That is amazing. I always love to hear that inspirational story of women giving back to the communities, um, especially the ones they live in and where their companies are. Um, so I'm wondering also on a personal level, um, as a woman executive, I'm sure obstacles have come your way. Um, uh, what are some things that you do to overcome challenges in your life? What are some strategies that you've implemented that you have you think might be helpful for other women to, to hear? Well, I'm very spiritual. So um, that's number one. But I stay focused on the things that I can control, and that's me. I control my emotions. I control my behavior. And I don't allow um, external things to distract me. So if I'm focused on a goal, sure, there will be times that I might have to go sideways and around an obstacle. Maybe times I have to pause and wait. But I don't allow external things to distract me from what I'm trying to accomplish. The other thing that I've learned over the years is patience. That's something that I didn't always have, but I'm a big believer in stepping back, looking at the landscape, having some quiet time and thinking about, okay, if it's not gonna happen this way, what are some other ways that I could execute and get it to happen? Yes, it always seems like we're in such a hustle culture. Just go, 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 do it, do it, do it. And to have patience and think strategically truly is uh, is a huge uh, a benefit. Yeah, to have. But I will tell you, whenever you respond with emotions, it's always bad. Yeah. So if you take a step back, you can think, okay, is this reality or is this emotion? Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm wondering, do you have any advice for the young women listening today? Uh, any advice for their career paths uh, as they enter healthcare, health IT? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, oftentimes I hear younger people say, well, I didn't get the job because they said I don't have the experience. Well, how am I going to get the experience if I don't get a chance to do the job? And one of the things that I often say, and I don't care what size company it is, there's always what I call white space. Mm. Things that need to get done that have no one that's assigned to do it. Go fill the white space until somebody tells you not to. And when you're doing that, you're demonstrating, A, that you do have skills that maybe others have not recognized you have. B, you're also learning on the job. And then thirdly, you're also stretching yourself. You know, I, I just think it's so important to be able to stretch yourself, not only in your learning, but in your abilities to multitask. That's not to say you want to multitask all the time, but you want to build that muscle to be able to do that when you need to do that. Absolutely. And I've always experienced that in my career too, is there is this white space where there should, something could be done better That's or right. you see there's a hole That's right. and filling it is right. so meaningful to the company. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And every person has an innate ability to see what that white space is, right. I think, in their own right. skill level. Because are, you'll, you'll be in an organization and that people will say, well, we really need to have this and somebody doing that. Well, go do that. Yeah, be that. <laughs> that's a great advice. I think that's really, really helpful and useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one other thing that I did also a lot in my career is I tried to have multiple jobs for a number of reasons. Number one um, was uh, to be able to stretch myself and learn. But also was to, you know, in big companies in particular, things shift, things change. And I also want to be able to say, well, yeah, I've been doing that job and I can do that job. If this one's going away, then I'll just go do this one. Oh, that's brilliant. So you kind of have your hands in different pieces of the company, yeah, filling right. that white space, but also making yourself invaluable. That's right. 
Wow, really great advice. So I'm interested in hearing a little bit about, uh, before we end today, about the work you're most proud of in your career. Um, what's some of the work that you've done where you're like, wow, I'm just so grateful to have been a part of that? Um, I think that was probably when I was working in China. China's changed a lot since then, and this was about 13, 14 years ago when I was working there. Uh, it's not as open to Westerners as it was then, but I can recall um, in building a team there, I um, had a couple of people that worked for me, or, well, a lot of them worked for me that were Chinese and didn't speak the English very well. And we had um, a number of American companies that we were doing work for, and we were presenting to those companies. And most of those companies had expats that were Americans. And I can recall one uh, young man said to me, I could tell he was very nervous. He said, I'm not sure I can present. And I said, yes, you can. You can do it. I said, because I'm going to be here to help you. If you get stuck, then I know what you've been doing and I'll step up. So we did, and he had a very successful presentation. But I'd say maybe five years ago, he reached out to me in, on LinkedIn and said to me, I just wanted to check in, see how you're doing, and I will never forget how you supported me when I was concerned about my English and presenting to our customers. Wow. So. It's amazing to be able to be in that position, to be that support and to encourage the people who work for you to be their best and work their best. Well, I think um, not to you know suggest that some men don't have that innate uh, instinct about how much it means to support. But I think women, because that's a role we play a lot, I think we are more readily willing to step in and also instinctively know when someone needs that support. Yeah, yeah. We kind of have a little bit more of that helpful instinct to yeah. to want to really encourage someone pers on that personal level um, more than just being in the work environment and doing well. It's, it's, it's going to always help the work environment do well. It's but. not just the helpful instinct. Yeah. It's the instinct to know when someone needs help yes if, yes if they don't know how to ask for it yeah yes that's very true well this has been such a wonderful conversation sheila we are so inspired by you and and your leadership there at gray matter analytics uh, to finish off this conversation right where can our listeners find you online i'm on linkedin as i just mentioned twitter and instagram and also before i forget did you happen to bring any tea with you today? I did. I did. And I oh, have to have wow. a beautiful cup that I got in Germany at the museum where they had the Nefertiti exhibit. That is so beautiful. That is so cool. Well, cheers to you. <laughs> you. That's fantastic. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for joining us, folks. Check out the Hit Like a Girl podcast and website for more great guests just like Sheila today. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about us or this guest by going to our website or visiting us on any of the socials with the handle Hit Like a Girl Pod. Thanks again. See you soon.